Chapter 3 Interdimensional Awareness and the Ancient Wisdom of Plants In one of the books the tall stranger gave me on that early Friday morning, Idria Shaw spoke highly of Dr. Claudio Naranjo, M.D. When I was in medical school, Dr. Naranjo was the director of the Center of Studies of Medical Anthropology at the University of Chile, where he researched non-ordinary states of consciousness in the arts and in spirituality. Dr. Naranjo's research in the United States for the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, focused on the therapeutic uses of psychoactive drugs. I mentioned this to Don Eduardo's partner, Teresa, since her research seemed similar. She told me she knew Dr. Naranjo. The two of them had worked together in Chile years before, but he was now in California. Dr. Naranjo's name also came up in my studies of the Enneagram, a Sufi system of nine personality types. When Don Eduardo suggested I go north, I decided a letter to Dr. Naranjo was in order. He wrote back a few weeks later, inviting me to come study with him. So I went to California during my three-month vacation that summer. Dr. Naranjo met me on the street in Berkeley. He was a skinny, shy man with hair that was quite long and an unkept beard. He had just returned from the Chilean desert where he studied with Oscar Ishazo. Ishazo was a Bolivian mystic who popularized the Enneagram in Chile and founded the esoteric school Arica, named after the town where the school was located. I saw in Dr. Naranjo's demeanor a sadness coupled with mystery. It was as if he knew something he did not wish to share. While he was not overly friendly, we got along quite well, considering our age difference. It was evident from our conversation upon my arrival that the two of us shared not only a geographic past, but also similar spiritual interests. He drove me to his house in Berkeley and told me it could be my base of operations for my entire sojourn in California, if I wished. He introduced me to the Assailant Institute in Big Sur, and during our week there convinced me to apply for a scholarship to their Gestalt therapy training program, a psychological system of dealing with both physiological and emotional traumas I had started to work with in the healing circles. Dr. Naranjo told me that if I was awarded the scholarship, I would be immersed in a way of living quite in tune with the existentialists I had studied in school. This experiential lifestyle entailed certain characteristics, being centered in the present, in the here and now, focusing on what you have, not what you don't have, emphasizing the tangible, not the imagined, fully utilizing the senses and downplaying thought processes, expressing rather than manipulating, explaining, justifying, or judging. Surrendering to the full scope of feeling, pain as well as pleasure, rejecting others' demands, rejecting the worship of idols, taking full responsibility for your actions, feelings, and thoughts, and surrendering to your true identity. The technique of choosing to live in the moment, sometimes called the present centeredness technique, did not undermine the importance of consciousness and responsibility. Rather, it focused on wholeness, awareness, and actuality. When I employed Gestalt therapy in my healing circles, I concentrated on an exercise called the continuum of awareness that is central to the therapy. Comparable to free association and psychoanalysis, the continuum of awareness involves looking at the past or the future as though it were happening now. In this way, an idea, a hope, or a dream could become a reality. If a patient came to me and said, I want to get well, I would have him rephrase and reframe his thinking by saying instead, I am well. Claudio and I sat on his front porch one afternoon, sipping herbal tea, 
and discussing the integration of various spiritual techniques and philosophies. I explained that I had been looking for a good opportunity to balance my learning of Zen, of silent meditation, with expressive communicative awareness. Your Gestalt training will definitely help you accomplish this. The therapy allows the individual to more easily connect with others, said Claudio. Could this connection be turned inward? I want to gain a greater understanding of myself, similar to what I experienced in my love affair with Francoise, I said. Claudia thought for a moment and then replied, there's a clear connection between Gestalt awareness and the broad sense of Zazen or Zen meditation, which embraces more than just correct posture. Entering fully into every action with total attention and clear awareness is no less Zazen. Basically, it develops and strengthens your attention. I once read a parable that illustrates this point, Claudio continued. It went something like this. The master was asked by a disciple for some maxims of the highest wisdom. The master took his brush and wrote, attention. The disciple asked, is that all? Would you not add something more? The master wrote it again, twice. Attention, attention. Well, the disciple was irritated. I don't see much depth or subtlety. Then the master wrote it a third time. Attention, attention, attention. Half angry, the disciple said, what does that word attention mean anyway? The master answered gently, attention means attention. I nodded in agreement, remembering my early Zen experiences. My Zazen practice began with counting the inhalations and exhalations of breath while sitting in a motionless Zazen posture. This stilled the body's functions, stopped the mind from rambling, and strengthened concentration. Once I mastered this, I learned a more difficult Zazen technique of following the inhalation and exhalation of the breath with the mind's eye only in a natural rhythm. I was amazed at the state of equilibrium I achieved. I learned that Zazen frees the mind from bondage to all thought forms, visions, objects, and phenomena, bringing the mind to a state of absolute emptiness from which one can perceive the sacredness of one's own nature and the nature of the universe. Dr. Naranjo also introduced me to a study group he attended called Seekers After Truth. The guest speakers I saw during my first few weeks of attending meetings represented a wide variety of traditions, including a Buddhist monk, a motivational consultant, an Indian meditation teacher, and a firewalker. One speaker who went by the nickname Creature seemed to embody in one person the variety of perspectives one would experience in several months of meetings. He had studied in India, Tibet, Japan, Indonesia, Mexico, Iceland, Scotland, France, Russia, and Morocco. He had been a monk, an anthropologist, a fisherman, and now was a teacher of Sufism. Since I was also interested in Sufism and had been exposed to quite a few other traditions in my relatively short 25 years of life, I looked forward to chatting with this oddly named man after his talk. With a name like Creature, one might expect a dark, hulking tangle of hair. In actuality, Creature was Anglo-Saxon in his features and almost a foot shorter than me in height. He was bald on top, but sported a large gray mustache. After his presentation, he stood with his wife in the front of the hall. When I approached him, he locked me in a gaze so intense, I became frightened and took a step back. You are too open, he told me, as his blue eyes softened. Do you let just anyone into your living room? I was at a loss for a response, but I didn't need to say anything because he went on after only a moment. You need to be more closed. If you aren't a little more selective in what you let in, 
you may put yourself in danger. Pollution, he added, is separation from radical unity. And this radical unity is the reconnection of the soul as a unit, as a oneness. His words reminded me of what my grandfather told me before he died. I told him that all my experience and training thus far had encouraged me to be open. We talked for almost half an hour. When he had heard I was looking into programs of conscious study, he invited me to visit his training institute in the San Bernardino Mountains of Southern California. A week later, I rode with one of Creature's students from the bus terminal to the institute in a dusty red pickup truck. I was a bit nervous during the last part of the ride. The road was only one lane. It curved and twisted uncomfortably close to some rather steep high cliffs. The institute was a converted sheep ranch, I learned. Most of the conversion involved turning the ranch hands' quarters into guest lodging. But the beds were still bunks, and the bathrooms were still communal, large, and not especially clean. I slung the one bag I'd brought up onto the top bunk in my room and lay down on the lower bunk to rest until dinner time. A light rain was falling when the dinner bell sounded, so I hurried with about two dozen other guests across the grounds to the main house where the meals were served. I scanned the sizable dining room for Creature, but didn't see him. One of the women at my table saw me looking around the room and anticipated my concern. He doesn't usually eat dinner with us, she volunteered. Evidently, he didn't eat breakfast with the guests either. Over our morning meal, I asked one of the men when I might expect to see Creature. He will be leading the morning meditation at 10, he told me, as he took another helping of omelet. I attended the meditation after breakfast. It was on attentiveness, and I wasn't particularly impressed. The group was left sitting in silence for most of the session. Creature approached me afterward. Did you enjoy the morning session? I searched for something positive. It was very straightforward, I said. He looked as if he wanted more feedback. I found it very relaxing. Attentiveness is the main goal of my work here at the Institute, he told me proudly. I have to go take care of some paperwork right now, but perhaps we could talk further after dinner tonight. I thanked him again for his invitation and told him I would look for him after dinner. He put on some sunglasses and headed for the main house. The afternoon session was similarly uninspiring. So when I encountered Creature walking along the main road after dinner, I asked him if he could suggest any other teachers. He seemed unfazed by the news of my impending departure and told me of a great teacher and shaman he called Don Hector, with whom he had studied recently in Mexico. He wrote out instructions on how I could get in touch with him. In a phone call with Don Hector the next morning, he told me to come visit any time. I called Dr. Naranjo to let him know I was going to Mexico. Then I asked one of the students to give me a ride back to the bus terminal. Two days later, my Aeromexico flight landed in the Distrito Federal. I took a taxi to the address Creature had given me. I expected to find other students of Sufism there since I knew Shaw had a study group in Mexico City. I was surprised to be very cordially greeted instead by a short, middle-aged man with a receding hairline who introduced himself as Don Hector. He wore glasses, a button-down shirt, and dark slacks. As he led me down the hall, I noticed the firm way he walked. It reminded me of a puma or tiger because I could sense he was aware of everything around him and could spring into action with but a thought. When Don Hector showed me to my room in the back of the small house near the kitchen, I heard voices in a room next to mine. He explained that others lived there with him, though I never got to see their faces. On that first day, he rarely spoke to me. He only looked at me and nodded when I encountered him. On the second day, I got up and decided to go for a walk and wander around the city since Don Hector had not yet given me any instructions. 
As I left through the front door of the house and started down the street, Don Hector called out to me from one of the windows of his house. Hey, have you been to the Museum of Anthropology? I shook my head no. That is where you will spend the day, he announced, and pulled his head back in the window. I asked directions on the street and made my way towards the museum. Mexico City was a dusty, confusing place for a traveler. The streets were wide and full of heavy traffic. Many of the neighborhoods I passed were poor and in obvious decline. I ended up at the museum about an hour after leaving. I bought something to eat and then spent the next six hours going through the many rooms filled with anthropology exhibits. I practiced sensing the electromagnetic fields produced by the stones and artifacts as I passed from one room to the next. I mused that thousands of tourists had passed through these same rooms and had no inkling of the effects those electromagnetic fields would have on their systems. I began to believe that the ancient people who had produced the items on display here had been counting on their ability to influence people hundreds of years later. The ancients had programmed these relics with their teachings and with scenes from their lives. These programs could be accessed by a sensitive person who stood near the relics and read their electromagnetic fields. That evening, I had my first real conversation with my host and teacher. He talked of the mystical lost continent of Atlantis and of the network of power points on the earth. He said people always seem to build churches and temples and shrines over these sources of terrestrial energy usually unaware of why that spot demanded a sacred use. I went to bed early on the narrow cot in my room, but I was restless. I tossed and turned half awake or fully conscious for hours. In the middle of the night, I saw a face appear in my doorway. There is never anything to fear, Don Hector said in the dim light from the hall, and then disappeared. I pondered that. There is never anything to fear. What did he mean by that? The house felt as if it were full of spirits or invisible guests. I did not see any of them, but I definitely heard conversations in dialects I couldn't understand. I thought about all the teachers I had met so far and wondered if it was my destiny to become a collector of teachings. Shortly after that, I finally fell asleep. The next morning, Don Hector stuck his head in my room and told me to get out of bed. We're going shopping, he said. He led me to the market of Sonora, which I'd heard about but never seen before. Thousands of vendors stood behind their stands, which stretched for a half mile along the roadside. Every kind of vegetable, fruit, herb, incense, powder, amulet, and talisman you could imagine was being bartered, traded, or sold there. Hello, Don Hector, was a familiar greeting from dozens of peasants we passed. I felt like I was being led through a movie set representing the 16th century. It seemed nothing had changed here in the last few hundred years. The crowd was packed tightly in some areas, so it was sometimes difficult for us to see where we were going. At one point, I stopped to buy some fruit at one of the stands. Don Hector turned to me and said with fierce conviction, plants were the first form of life on earth millions of years before people. By the time humans showed up, plants already knew everything there was to know. My ancestors taught us that the green cover of the earth has a marvelous relationship with the sun. Plants use their green chlorophyll to more directly synthesize solar rays into life. We started walking again, and Don Hector continued, This energy has information. The spirit of each plant knows how to become the source of all living processes. Through its vitamins and minerals, it produces a particular medicine. I will introduce you to a plant that has properties that can't be explained. It has a spirit that can carry human minds to destiny outside their understanding, back to their roots and beyond, he said mysteriously. We will meet a cactus, Don Hector explained. That is the reason for your visit to this country. We have been watching you. We will continue to watch you as you go to a temple that borders the spiritual dimensions. Peyote is one of our sacred plants. 
These plants make bridges between man and the great spirit. Peyote is like a messenger because he can speak with the spirits. And more than that, this plant will leave an anchor in you so that the higher spirits can come find you later and whisper to you in your sleep what they want you to know for the rest of your life, he added ominously. He held out the palm of his hand and said abruptly, give me some pesos. I handed him the equivalent of five dollars, which he gave to a peasant in a poncho and sombrero. The older man gave Don Hector a brown paper sack. Don Hector gave the bag to me. Then he laughed and called to the man. Drink a beer on my health with the change. I looked into the bag. It was filled with cactus. Don Hector looked serious once more when he said, I want to teach you something very important. It is a prayer of protection. If you say it when you're about to engage the spirit world, you will not have to fight the dark forces, nor will you risk absorbing their evil accidentally. Listen carefully, because you will need to memorize it before tomorrow. Spirits, protect me. May the white light of knowledge surround me and protect me from ignorance. May the green light of healing surround me and give me strength. May the violet light of transmutation surround me and send with neither love nor hate whatever forces are not in resonance with these three lights back to its origin. Now we must be on our way. He gave me a quick glance and then darted through the crowds much faster than before. I actually had trouble keeping up with him on the way back to his house. When we got there, he dumped the contents of the bag out onto the kitchen table and gestured for me to take a seat. Do you trust me? Don Hector asked with a smile as he sat down at the table. I told him I did. Even though you speak Spanish, you have la facha de gringo, he said accusingly, in reference to my fair hair and complexion. And do you know how little we think of them here? I felt that surrender was key at this point. I do, I replied. You don't yet know what a plant is, he said, as he picked through the pieces of cactus on the table. I understand how many plants are the source for the pharmacology of healing, I ventured. Plants cure because they are toxic, he explained. The difference between a medicine, a narcotic, and a poison is the dose. The fruits of the gods are toxic to man, and you are about to eat one. Without losing consciousness, you'll enter into a dream state that will seem more vivid than everyday living. It is there that you will learn the purpose of your journey to Mexico. After you have this experience, you must leave Mexico and travel to the old Inca Fortress, Sacsayhuaman, near Cusco, Peru. You will go all by yourself. He pulled an envelope from a nearby drawer and handed it to me. There you will open this envelope and swallow its contents. I looked down at the cactus on the table and said, I am ready. You may be ready, but the plant is not, he said with a smile. Today we prepare it, and tomorrow you can have your journey. We cooked the peyote buttons for a long time and then mixed them with fruit and sugar to make a marmalade. He told me it would still taste very bitter, but the sugar would help. When the mixture had cooled, we spooned most of it into a yogurt container and put it in the refrigerator. By the time we finished making the peyote marmalade, it was late at night and I was exhausted. I fell asleep quickly. It was still dark out and I felt I'd just fallen asleep when Don Hector came and woke me early the next morning. He told me which buses to take to get to Teotihuacan, the site of some ruins about 60 miles outside of Mexico City. When you get there, Don Hector instructed, you need to take your yoga container to the top of the pyramid of the moon and eat the marmalade there. What, I asked? Alone in the middle of some ruins? Are you afraid, he smiled. No, I'm fine. I lied, fearing he would tell me I was not ready. Mescal will guide you in your journey, Don Hector said in blessing. 
May you speak with the gods and learn about us. He thrust the yogurt container into my hands and commanded, now go. Three hours later, I got off a bus and made my way through many bands of roving tourists, a multicultural melange. They seemed to come from every corner of the globe. I recognized Japanese, English, French, and German phrases. Wiping the dust from my eyes, I headed toward the ruins with my marmalade, ready to climb one of the pyramids. Don Hector had instructed me to go to the top of the Pyramid of the Moon, a ruin with 87 steps leading to its pinnacle, which was built at the opposite end of a long dirt road. Along this road stood the Pyramid of the Sun, a smaller monument flanked by other ruins. A sign in four languages proclaimed the road leading to the two pyramids to be the Avenue of the Dead. It took me another hour and a half to get to the top of this exquisite monument and find a small private place for this sacred action. No wonder Don Hector told me to start out so early, I thought to myself. I repeated the prayer of protection Don Hector had taught me and ate the horribly bitter mixture we had made the day before. It was difficult to swallow, but I was determined to succeed, so I forced it down. Despite the occasional tromping, huffing, and puffing of tourists proud to have survived the climb to the top, I settled down on the smooth stones and started my journey. Gradually, the bottom part of the pyramid disappeared until all that was left was the top and the last few upper steps. I felt warmth and some sort of rounded enclosure forming around the top of the pyramid as if I were in a huge womb. The pounding of some huge celestial drum seemed to echo through the heavens. When I looked down and saw how far I was from the ground, I questioned if I would ever return to Earth. There no longer seemed to be a way down from the pyramid. Feeling very isolated from the rest of humanity, I floated there high above the ground. I thought back to all the times in school when I had felt this way. At parties, I would spend most of my time talking about philosophy to anyone who stayed long enough to listen before returning to the dance floor. I was given the nickname of the professor. In medical school and during my internship, I was shunned by many because my talk of the healing powers of love and of the soul made me seem strange. But this feeling of isolation that had brought me sadness and loneliness was now making me feel differently. The isolation I felt on the top of this pyramid stirred feelings of pride for some reason. I felt like I had won some honor, successfully completed an initiation. As I began to feel closer to the rest of humanity, I gradually realized it was my differentness that was allowing me to connect with others more deeply. As I turned this paradox over in my mind, I also realized I now had a clearer understanding of the process of individuation. The concept had always seemed a simple case of breaking from the expectations of one's parents. I remembered that paradoxes were a mark of soul awareness, and perhaps this feeling of being unique and separate, yet connected to others, was another such marker. I came to understand that as a person's true self is realized, the forces of heaven and earth rapidly come together to speed the individuation process. Life becomes rich and full as one naturally and spontaneously gravitates towards the activities and situations that are in harmony with one's own realization. Defensive, superficial, and uninteresting activities and engagements drop away. It seemed to me that as more people connected with their essence, it would extend to the emergence of a new culture, a new way of relating, a new interpersonal ethic that allowed for global realization. Life was a continuity of being instead of a string of events. When one was fully evolved, the self naturally translated into the light of essence. On top of this pyramid, I was growing in understanding my true essence. I saw that there was a meaningful synchronous order in the cosmos. I felt myself composed of light energy. It was a feeling that is difficult to describe, but I had an overall sense of 
absolute knowledge. While in this state, I knew that I would return to the same spot, the pyramids of Teotihuacan, 12 years later, a fact that was absolutely crucial in my future life. Hours later, when the bottom of the pyramid reappeared, the sky was dark. I climbed down to the ground quickly. It was late at night when I reached the Avenue of the Dead again. As I walked down the road, I felt like I was being followed by a beam of light. Slowly, I perceived crowds of tourists watching the nightly light and sound show and realized the lights following me were very much of this world. When I got back to Don Hector's house, it was after midnight. Hector was up waiting. How did it go, he asked. His voice was cold and stern. I told him I felt tired, but okay. When I began to tell him what I had experienced on my journey, he interrupted me. Keep the gold for yourself so that it will strengthen your fiber. I'm surprised at the late hour, I told Don Hector. I had no idea I was in the ruins for such a long time. You must understand, he said. Your attention was not earthbound. Galactic time and space is a completely different concept. I enthusiastically talked of my insights on individuation and its role in the synchronous order of the cosmos. Don Hector cut me off again, sighing. There is still much that you must learn, he said. You have already contacted the Tibetans and some of us, the Teotihuacanos. I advise you to learn from the collected wisdom of the indigenous peoples who have not become industrialized. The Mayans, the Hopis, the Kiwanis, the Tibetans, and understand they have a notion of galactic time. The world is going to come to a point where the identity of the soul becomes a galactic identity. Later in history, it will become apparent. I realize I still have a great deal to learn, I said. But after today, I feel I have a greater understanding of myself. I've always wanted to serve humanity, and now I know I'm on the right path. We sat in silence for a few minutes. The sound of the ticking clock filled the void. Don Hector held his hands as if in prayer, bringing them up to meet his lips. Setting them down gently on the table, he leaned forward and looked directly into my eyes. You are being trained now, he said. Later, you will form groups around the world to discuss these issues and to actively participate as a newly admitted member of a higher galactic order. There will be a lot of light, photonic energy composed of electromagnetic radiation coming into the planet. As it approaches our solar system, many people like yourself are being exposed and trained in order to ascend their perceptions from a third dimensional to a fifth dimensional reality. Photonic energy is what will matter. What is this fifth dimensional reality, I asked. It is a new integrated spirituality that is emerging. In your journey, you are being trained in the substance of different spiritual traditions. This new spirituality is going to show that the disciplines of science, technology, and spirituality can all merge. This unity is an aspect of fifth dimensional reality. I see, I said. Am I in the right place to learn this knowledge? Is there one tradition I should be learning from? No, Don Hector answered. Don't be completely identified with any one tradition. Anyone who educates you to stick with one tradition is just brainwashing you. Toward the end of the century, which is the end of this karmic cycle, the traditions will merge into this new spirituality, a consciousness aimed toward the highest good of all, a mission of wholeness. The next morning, I packed my bags, including the envelope Don Hector had given me, and searched the house to say goodbye to my host. I found him sitting on the front step. He wished me well and reminded me to use the prayer of protection he had taught me. I set off for the airport. My plane landed around noon in Lima, Peru. I had plenty of time to wander around the city before my connecting flight the next morning. I checked in at my hotel and then visited the Gold Museum, 
which housed relics of pre-Incan civilizations. At this museum, I experienced a sense of cultural change, so to speak. Having been born and trained in the Western mode, Peru showed me that long before Western civilization invaded this country, there were many sequences of civilizations that lived and loved and cared and worked and developed a life of their own, civilizations of which very little is known today. I was humbled and realized there was a lot to learn. Western arrogance had made a false model of what it meant to be alive in the 20th century. I ate dinner at an outdoor cafe and stayed out late at a plaza where I watched and eventually participated in a ritual Incan folk dance. It was an almost ecstatically orgasmic dance, reminiscent of the original tribal rituals. The combination of music and dancing was so soothing, I felt like I was in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. I didn't realize how tired and sore I had become until hours later when I stumbled back to my hotel. The next morning, Saturday, I went back to the airport and boarded my flight to Cusco. The view from the plane window as we ascended high over mountains was spectacular. Once we landed and I checked into my hotel room in Cusco, an ancient Incan city, 11,000 feet above sea level, one of the maids brought me a tea brewed from cacao leaves. She said it would help me adapt to the higher altitude. We give it to all our guests when they arrive, she said as she left. I drank the tea and immediately fell asleep for the next 24 hours. I woke up late Sunday morning, a bit lightheaded and very, very hungry. I checked at the hotel desk for suggestions about eating establishments, and the young man told me to try going to the nearby village of Pisac. There's an open-air market with food and entertainment there every Sunday, he said. As I walked through the city toward the bus bound for the Pisac market, I admired the three snow-capped peaks surrounding the valley. The city had been a center for healers since the days of the Incan Empire, and I hoped that this market was the best place to meet them. Indians from various tribes came down from the mountain peaks and up from the valleys to sell their corn and potatoes and handcrafts, play the Andean flute, sing, dance, and gossip. I had heard that the Quechua Indians often used the mine alternating ayahuasca vine in their rituals. Since I was interested in sacred initiatory substances, I tried to find one of these Indians. The soul is trying to contact you, called a strange voice. I turned and saw an old Indian man sitting on the ground selling colorful ponchos. His wide cheeks and eyes were surrounded by deep lines etched into his face by Mexico's intense sun, and he wore one of his own ponchos over his dark, dusty clothes. He nodded when I looked at him, but his eyes quickly broke contact with mine as he scanned the area around him. I approached him and asked, Do you know where I might find the ones who have ayahuasca? The old man looked away and didn't respond. I retrieved the envelope Don Hector had given me from my jacket pocket. Maybe I already have some ayahuasca, I suggested as I held out the envelope to the man selling ponchos. He slowly leaned forward and took the envelope from me. His brow furrowed, and he opened the envelope to sift through the brown powder in it. Ayahuasca is called the vine of the dead. It helps those who eat it connect with the world of spirits, he said. He returned the envelope to me and continued, You don't have a vine. You have a root. I tried to ask the old man if he knew anything else about the brown powder or about ayahuasca, but he refused to talk further and waved me away. I stayed at the market for an hour longer and then boarded the bus back to Cusco. The next morning, I ate a quick breakfast and set out with some water, some bread, and my envelope containing the mysterious brown powder. The Incan fortress at Sacsayhuaman, located on one of the nearby peaks, was visible from the street in front of my hotel. I headed in the general direction of the peak, and eventually I came across a dirt path leading up the hill towards the ruins. 
It was almost noon when I finally reached the stone walls of Sacsayhuaman. I had taken several rests on the way up, since the fortress was almost another thousand feet above Cusco. But I was still breathless and sweating when I reached Sacsayhuaman. I was completely alone in the fortress, so I wandered about the site for a few minutes, around huge stone monoliths, through ornately carved trapezoidal archways. Then I heard the sound of diesel engines approaching. Soon two buses filled with tourists arrived. The visitors were quickly squealing at the majestic views and snapping photographs. I searched the ruins for about an hour before settling on a quiet location to perform the second part of Don Hector's initiation ritual. I sat on a stone pedestal on the edge of the site on the far side of a seven-foot-high stone wall. I figured the location would give me a view of Cusco and the rest of the valley below, give me shelter from the hot sun most of the afternoon, and keep me secluded from most of the other visitors. I repeated the prayer of protection Don Hector had taught me and visualized the three colored lights descending over me. Then I swallowed the brown powder and washed it down with water from my flask. The first thing I noticed after several minutes was the brightening of the colors around me. The greens in the drying grass were more vivid. The sky seemed a brighter, deeper blue. The gray and red tones of the rocks looked as if they had been painted on with bright paints. I gazed down at the valley and the city looked much bigger and regal the river more forceful as it meandered along, almost electric. The sounds of the tourists and the buses gradually faded away, and I felt very isolated and remote from humanity once again. I felt much more connected with the earth itself, a sort of consonance with the harmonies of life. As I stared at the landscape and the nearby rocks, the air seemed to shimmer as if it were very hot. There appeared an arching strand of energy just above the ground, stretching toward the horizon. Then more lines of energy began appearing. They started crossing. I saw some of the lines begin just above the ground in the ruins behind me. After a while, I found myself in the midst of a complex web of energy, covering the ground as far as I could see. I felt that this web of energy was always present everywhere that when we become centered and contacted our higher self, it was revealed to us. Here was another mark of soul awareness, I thought. I remembered how connected I felt to the natural world when I had been in the Central Valley with Francoise, and I realized that it was the West's preoccupation with technology and human-built structures that actually made it more difficult to connect with the soul. As I studied the strands of Earth energy stretching to the horizons, I sensed that the earth itself was not only a key to our connection with our vital identity, but was also important in connecting with the soul of others. I felt this grid of energy was the foundation on which a new world with new values would be built. It was the structure that held everything in the third dimension together, because all of humanity was held together in the third dimension. This total sense of being of I amness was more dominant than the singular sense of personal identity. It was the essential identity of humanity, which allowed for the understanding that we can be together as a human race. I also perceived the presence of others. These beings were physical at other times, but here they existed as the custodians of the earth and lived in this other dimension. They were the keepers of knowledge they understood these other dimensions that had subtly penetrated my own structures of awareness. An enrichment of my soul memory was surreptitiously taking place. Particles of information about this ancient wisdom were incorporated into my system to be utilized at the appropriate times. These guardians were teachers working with me to unleash my heart's service. Fourth dimensional reality came from higher or more subtle ways of being that we, existing in the third dimension, could not grasp. As the intersecting strings of energy started to fade, I noticed the sun was very low on the horizon. The buses and tourists had gone, 
and I was once more alone in the ancient fortress. I looked around the ruins one last time, took a deep breath, and headed back down the mountainside. I later discovered the brown powder I swallowed that day up at Sasquawaman was an African root called iboga, used by the Buridi tribe of Gabon in a ritual to communicate with their ancestors and heal the soul of the community. It is now being studied by Western scientists for its ability to help addicts in recovery. It seems to gently show them the fears and childhood memories they are trying to repress with alcohol and drug abuse. Because I still had more than a week before I had to return to my residency in Chile, I studied some maps back at my hotel in Cusco. I realized I wasn't far from Machu Picchu, another famous Incan city. I inquired about transportation at the hotel front desk and was told to be at the train station the next morning. Late the next afternoon, I got off the train with my one suitcase in a small town named Aguas Calientes for the therapeutic hot springs there. The town was little more than a street lined with colonial houses, along which vendors sold jewelry, ponchos, and the many other objects tourists are likely to buy. There was a small inn across from the train station, but the girl who greeted me at the inn's front porch told me there were no rooms available anywhere near the train station. She suggested I try an inn on the edge of town, and she gave me directions to get there. The directions weren't too hard to follow. There was only one street in Aguas Calientes, so I followed it to the edge of the town in the direction the girl pointed. I easily found the two-story yellow house the girl had described. When I entered the house, I walked into an old-fashioned parlor with oriental rugs, tapestries on the walls, a ceiling fan, a love seat, and chairs trimmed with tassels and fringe, and a very large water pipe or hookah on a small low table. A gentle breeze came through the two windows and made the wooden blinds tap in unison against their window frames. I noticed a poster proclaiming a Jefferson airplane concert in San Francisco on one of the walls. Eventually, I was greeted by a short man with gray hair, a mustache, and glasses. Hello, he said. Are you here for the hot springs or the ruins? Both, I replied. Is there a room I could have for the next few days? Ordinarily not, the man said with a smile, but one of our longtime residents, a younger Mitizo guy, just left us to take a job in Lima, so the fourth room is open. He explained there were two other Native Americans, he didn't know what tribe, that had been with him for several weeks. There was also an American couple who had arrived a few days earlier to study the ruins at Machu Picchu. He took money for the next two nights, asked me to sign a guest book, and then showed me to my room. The room itself was so narrow I could touch opposite walls simultaneously. But there was a little cot, a shelf for my suitcase, and a basin of water and a tall stand, so I decided it would suffice. I met the inn's other four guests at the complimentary buffet in the parlor that evening. I got the impression the two Indian men didn't speak much Spanish, so I spent most of my time talking to the American couple in English. They were from California and were anthropologists who were making their way through Central and South America, studying the lifestyles of the ancient Mayans and Incas from what was left of their cities, temples, and writings. They were dressed in the hippie fashion of the times, and with their blonde hair, blue eyes, and pale skin seemed quite a bit out of place in Mexico. The woman introduced herself as Lisa and her husband and colleague as Roger. What is your interest in the ruins, Roger asked me. I wasn't sure yet how open I could be about my interest in mysticism with these people, so I claimed to be just visiting. We've been spending the past few days up at Machu Picchu, Lisa said, but tomorrow we are going to Huina Picchu. We've heard that there are some carvings there that might add to our research. What have you found so far at Machu Picchu, I asked. There seem to be a lot of references to two particular figures, Lisa explained. We've seen them at other sites, but here you see pictures and references to Pachamama, the Cosmic Mother, and to Rarakosha, the Great Spirit everywhere. We see them as a sky god and the goddess of the earth. I finished my tea and set it on a nearby table. So what is there to do in Aguas Calientes on Tuesday night? After climbing up to and around in those ruins all day, Roger volunteered, 
We always go to the hot springs to relax. We'll be going in a few minutes. Would you like to join us? I told them I would, and after getting some belongings from my room, I met them back in the parlor. The three of us followed a well-worn dirt path just off the main street to a series of pools along a stream running through a little valley. There were five others there at the springs, but the three of us found a nice warm pool to ourselves and talked further about our travels and about the ruins I would visit that next morning. The climb from my funky little inn in Aguas Calientes up to the ruins at Machu Picchu the next morning looked a little too long to take by foot, so I boarded a small bus with a handful of other visitors at eight o'clock. I settled down in my seat and tried to relax as much as the bumpy two-hour ride up the mountain would allow. A couple of Quechua Indian guards greeted our bus when we reached the end of the road. They led our little group up a footpath from where the bus was parked. I noticed they were both armed with pistols. We turned a bend, and from behind a cliff, the structures of Machu Picchu were revealed. It took us several more minutes to get to the site itself. Some in our party felt fatigued, not yet adjusted to the high altitude. The sight of Machu Picchu was truly awe-inspiring. It appeared to be a city grown right out of the mountain. The ruins were better preserved here than those at Sacsayhuaman. Where before I had only seen a few walls and pedestals, here at Machu Picchu were complete buildings with roofs and windows and the suggestion of furnishings and decorations. The stone carvings were still broken and worn, but there were more of them to see and study. I tried to make out the figures of Pachamama and Raracosha that Lisa and Roger had told me about. I found out from one of the guards that although the bus departed down the mountain for Aguas Calientes at two o'clock, I could stay another two hours if I wanted. You will, of course, have to walk back, he said with a grin, but you will have a better chance of finding what you are looking for when you are up here alone. I smiled back and wondered if he really did not know why I was there. There was a glint of recognition in his eyes that belied the macho ribbing and seemed to imply otherwise. I called out muchas gracias to him as he walked away to continue his patrolling. I'll do that. I followed a routine during my days at Machu Picchu, taking the bus to the site, walking back down in the late afternoon, and taking a bath at the hot springs before bed. I started thinking... I should try again to find an Indian to help me get some ayahuasca. But I couldn't communicate what I wanted to my fellow in guests, and the guards at the ruins seemed unapproachable. I wanted to get some further insight out of this trip, so I decided to stay up at the ruins overnight on the fourth day. I took the bus up the mountain in the morning as usual. By the time the bus left with the other visitors that afternoon, the guards had become used to my staying behind and walking down later. When I started down the path toward Aguas Calientes around sunset that day, I could see the guards getting in their jeep and heading down the road too. I climbed back up to the site and found a building in which to pass the night. I put a blanket and some food I'd brought in the building, then wandered back out on the cliff to watch the setting sun and the rising of the nearly full moon. As I sat there in the bright moonlight that evening, I scanned the shadowy ruins set into the cliff. Once or twice I imagined shadows in motion amid the stones, walls, and buildings, but everything was so completely quiet otherwise, I dismissed them at first. The moon was almost overhead by the time my eyelids started drooping, and I trudged back to the building where I stowed my things. I laid down on the dirt floor and started imagining what the original occupants' lives might have been like here in this city on a high mountain cliff. I was awakened almost an hour later by what sounded like footsteps. I held my breath and listened more closely. They seemed to stop. I carefully and quietly got up and moved to the doorway to see if there indeed were others out there. A couple of clouds rolled across the sky, but the moon still shone brightly on the ruins, which again seemed very still and abandoned. I laid down again, but just as I was falling asleep, I heard footsteps. Instead of getting up this time, I remained lying down, listening. The steps were slow, walking, not running. 
There seemed to be groups of people going in different directions. The more I listened, the more footsteps I could make out. I started to worry that I was hallucinating. I lifted my head and sat up. The footsteps once again disappeared. I got back to sleep and passed the rest of the night undisturbed. When the sunlight from the window reached my face the next morning, I woke up, gathered my things together, and ambled outside. The guards had already arrived in anticipation of the busload of tourists. One of the Keshua guards said something to the other and then started walking toward me. He didn't seem very threatening, so I was convinced that I wasn't in trouble. You decided to spend the night, the guard asked, when he was within a few feet of me. I nodded. Did you hear the footsteps? My jaw dropped. Yes, I did. What are they? My people have a story, the Indian guard explained. They say that one day all the Incas disappeared. Maybe 20,000 of them disappeared. Nobody knows where they went or what happened to them. But my people believe they never really left. They're still here. You just can't see them anymore. There is an invisible, holy, sacred city where they live in another dimension. They're waiting for the sign of a new world order. Evolution from animals to humans is based on the vibrations that will cause the reemergence of the new civilization. Then the secret Incas will emerge and they will meet humankind. They will meet a new humanity. The look of fascination on my face must have encouraged him because he continued. They come up here from where they live down at Huina Pichu, the new hill, because this was an observatory for them. They come up here from their crystal city down in the valley to look out at the sky and the rest of the world for a sign. They're waiting down there in the sacred valley for the day when the ancient prophecy comes true. A new old world will come, it says, and people will become disinterested in possessions. Matters of the spirit will become all important. The need to control each other will disappear. All genuine seekers from every land and religion will gain the knowledge of the creator. That's when we'll be able to see them again. The guard turned to go back to his post, then stopped and looked over his shoulder. That's just a story, though, he called back to me.